My name is Dick Anderson. I am alcoholic. And my sobriety date is June the 8th, 1977. And my home group is the uh, Macklin Group in Powder Springs, Georgia, which is next to Lithia Springs. We have a lot of springs in that area of Georgia. And, uh, and I joined there about three or four years ago, and uh, uh, we had moved out in that area. I couldn't find a group that I really liked. There wasn't a group like this there. And I joined a group that had about 15 people in it, and we started having group conscious meetings. And um, I suggested we have a greeter. In fact, I volunteered to be the head greeter the first year. And we started making sure everybody in our uh, group got a job when they came here. So now we have about 120 to 150 people on Thursday night. Enough people that we have started a beginner's meeting on Thursday night so that um, the very newest people uh, get to find out in a separate room what A is about. And they also don't uh, interrupt the regular meeting that's going on out in the, in the big hall. And we've started a 12-step and 12-tradition meeting. And we have a women's meeting. And all that's happened in the last three years from a group that was just sitting there for a while waiting to take off, but we practiced AA principles, and the most important thing we did was make sure that anybody who walked in the door with that greeting uh, felt like they were absolutely loved. Uh, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, that was the one thing, the unconditional love that I got here, I found no place else, because nobody else understood why I did what I did, and you did. So uh, in May, I was speaking at uh, Woodstock, the thing over in Cocoa Beach, and uh, some people I was, were coming up to thank me, and this guy pops up out of the crowd. looks like a, a Bill and Ted. Is it Bill and Ted or Bob and Ted? Bill and Ted. Well, down, down here would be Billy, Bob, and Ted. Billy, Bob, and Ted's <laughs> excellent adventure just pops up. He says, hey, you want some waffles? And I said, yeah, I'll meet you. I, I was, I've been around a while, so I figured there was maybe something besides the waffles he wanted to talk about. So I said, uh, yeah. So I said, well, why don't we meet at so-and-so? And uh, I showed and he didn't. So I caught him the next day. If you make an appointment with me, I remember it. And uh, I caught him the next day and I said, uh, hey, I was there for the waffles. Where were you? And he said, well, I didn't think you'd show up. <laughs> so, uh, but he uh, called me a little while ago and asked me if I would come down here to speak for his birthday. And so uh, I showed up. <laughs> and, and, and that's really what it's about, um, being here as part of a miracle. And I, I, uh, I don't put anything about myself on Facebook because I really don't want you knowing what I'm doing. But, um, <laughs> but I watch what everybody else is doing on Facebook, include all of the guys I sponsor who tell me that they're not dating and then they latest love. And uh, um, it's a good way to get information on the guys you're sponsoring. And, um, but I see the great enthusiasm that Matt has on his page and how much he loves Alcoholics Anonymous. And I loved Alcoholics Anonymous when I got here. And I've never fallen out of love with Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you are that way and you're willing to take some big, big changes in your life, then um, not only will you stay sober for a long time, but many, many miracles will take place. And there's a lot of the high and the fun that we have when we come to an event like this is replaced by something called joy. Joy is that inner sense that whether or not things are going well. On the trip down here today, we uh, learned that Barbara's uh, sponsor of many years is in hospice and getting ready to pass away tonight. And she's, she's lived a long life. She, she had 50 some odd years in Al-Anon and uh, she is, uh, uh, she's 90. Her husband died three weeks ago and I think sometimes that happens. To, her husband was 92, they've been married for a long time. But it was still sad. But that's part of our life and we were able to be part of her. And, uh, uh, and then we come down here and we have the joy of the birthdays that are taking place. And, and the reason that people that have been around for a long time smile at the new guys is because we know what is yet to come. It just gets better and better and better. And I'm not talking about the circumstances. I'm talking about the way we live with life inside. I never thought I could live this way. So the name of this group, The Fourth Dimension, um, is appropriate because that's really what I've been talking about recently uh, more than anything else. In our fellowship, as much as I travel around, there are lots of places where you can find great fellowship and lots of enthusiasm. And enthusiasm, by the way, is, is, uh, comes from the Greek, in theos, which means God in us. And so what people see when they're excited, when they walk into a room like this, is, is God. And I think that if you make this very simplistic, and it doesn't sound great to somebody who just walked in off the street, <laughs> but the deal is that I was missing God, the presence of God in my life, a kind and loving God. I knew nothing about God when I got here. Here's the good news. 
I don't think, I've never met anybody who walked into Alcoholics Anonymous during their first few years that had any idea who God was. But God was there for them nonetheless. And I don't think there's anybody that walks in here that hasn't been prayed in here, that somebody hasn't cared enough about them. You know, from what I understand, Matt reached a pretty good bottom. Here's a guy that was homeless. I was homeless 35 years ago. I was homeless, and uh, weren't, weren't you out on the street just about dead? <laughs> He looked at me like he was going to correct me. That out on the street's homeless, and so, uh, <laughs> so and some 35 years ago, I was sitting in uh, uh, in a basement apartment where I'd been uh, living with no furniture, not paying the rent, water on the floor, and I couldn't tell anybody because I wasn't paying the rent, and uh, living on a bathroom floor where I. Didn't have any food my last two or three years. And I developed enough brain damage that it took me about a year and a half to learn how to read after I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I got here, I couldn't read the big book because I couldn't, couldn't understand what you were saying. I stayed here my first year and a half just off of the love and, and being here. And I went to a meeting every hour that I could get to a meeting um, off of the fellowship. But I watched what you were doing and the way you lived and the way that people had been living who were a little bit ahead of me. And the best big book we have is the way in which we live, not what we say. But I'll try to share in words what's happened to me during this last few years. Um, this, I come from a family where you would not have thought I would have had any kind of problem. Uh, there's no record of alcoholism in my family. Um, our reunions, they have iced tea and lemonade. A uh, long line of military heroes. Um, my little sister's a retired bird colonel. Her husband's a retired bird colonel. Their son graduated from West Point. We got a lot of West Point and uh, an Annapolis grad. I'm named for my great-great-grandfather, who was a uh, three-star general under Lee. He was named for his grandfather, who was a one-star general under uh, George Washington. And um, my dad was one of the most decorated pilots in World War II. And then came me. <laughs> and I'm kind of like Forrest Gump in Lieutenant Dan's family. <laughs> without the focus or integrity. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, I just didn't fit in. I really, from the beginning, I can't remember any time at which I felt like I fit in with the rest of my family. I just didn't fit in. Uh, we're going to have in two weeks, so uh, we got one weekend, I got my sponsor's got his 55th AA birthday, and I'm chairing that, and, and Tom Ivester speaking, and then uh, the next night we're having a surprise uh, 90th birthday party for my dad. Uh, as much as you want to surprise a 90-year-old. but uh, <laughs> And there are all these people that honor him. And I go back and I'm putting together a video for him and all these honors. So I grew up in this family. I just didn't feel like I fit in. So I pretended to be somebody I wasn't, in person, with people. And that's the way I was. I just I did not feel like I fit in at all. Now, my family was a very faith-filled family, and they were very, uh, they went to church, but they weren't dogmatic about it. They just believed that God was. Stonewall Jackson was named Stonewall because he believed when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. Why fear anything? And he stood up like a stone wall and his men followed him. And he was a man of great faith and that was the way most of my family were. And so I heard about it and I knew about it. That's the way they were. They were gentle in that. Nobody, nobody uh, yelled or screamed or forced me to do anything, but they were at church every Sunday and, and I just didn't fit in there either. The activities I was involved in were all activities that taught good morals, taught me the same morals I would have learned here in Alcoholics Anonymous if I had been able to learn from them, and I couldn't. Uh, Little League, YMCA, 4-H, Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts, it says in the handbook that the, best, the way we please God best is to do something anonymously to help somebody each day. That's what we do in AA. But I couldn't do that. For whatever reason, I could not do that. I was constantly concerned with how I was doing my entire world was about how I was and how what you thought about me, about not fitting into my family. Uh, about the time I was growing up, there was a small invention. It was a little black and white square thing called a television. And, um, uh, and that, came, that came out, we got our first TV when I was about six or seven years old. And, and there were shows on there that were also were very good moral teachers. The Andy Griffith Show, Leave it to Beaver, Ozzie and Harriet, Father Knows Best. And, and in those shows um, became more real to me. I would sit and watch those shows. I would get lost in those shows. They would become more real to me than out here because I felt ill at ease with other people, but I felt comfortable with these shows. 
and they became my moral compass. If uh, Opie or Wally got off the beam someplace, uh, by the end of the show, Dad had taken his pipe, turned it to one side, said something wise, Opie or Wally got the message, did the right thing, and, uh, and, and I learned. If I had a problem, I took it, and that's what Opie and Wally did. They were my first sponsors. And, um, so I, I grew up in this kind of, you know, that's the way, if we are ill at ease with people and with God, then where else do we go? We've got to find some kind of escape because that's all there is. So for us to feel comfortable, we take some kind of escape. We use as much alcohol or as much drugs as we can, but before I ever took my first drink, I was using television, I was using fantasy, I would daydream. You know, I got, I was a smart kid, I got A's in the academics, but I got bad grades and they used to write, uh, in, in those days I was called Dickie. Dickie daydreams all the time. I found about three or four report cards with that on it. You know, now I get paid to do that. I write and produce a film. But, uh, <laughs> but it was then, I was daydreaming, and that was the only way I felt comfortable, like a Walter Mitty existence. Now I did things, I played sports, I was active in music, I, was, I did a lot of things, I did a lot of things well. Uh, but I didn't feel like I really fit in in any of those things. I had my first spiritual experience when I went to the drive-in and saw my first color movie, and I was about six or seven. I went with my dad and, and uh, mom and my little sister, the soon-to-be retired colonel, and although she was about four or five at that time, and we went to the East Drive-in, and I saw this, the big book says, lack of power is our dilemma. Uh, and that's the way I felt, I felt powerless. Up on the screen was this example of tremendous power. The movie was the Ten Commandments. And up was a guy named Moses, and, the, and the, the wind would just blow through his hair, and he would take his staff and turn it to one side, and the Red Sea would part. And I was just overwhelmed also seeing a, a movie that was 120 feet wide. And I didn't know at that point, God reaches us where, where he wants to reach us. And I write and produce film. So he was reaching me through the very medium that he would bring me into. He gave me a heart for that early on. I don't think any of the gifts that we're given are bad. They're all good if we use them the way God wants us to. But I didn't know how to use anything for God. I didn't know how to use anything for anybody else. That my whole entire intent with everything I did at that point was to use everything for me, to make me happy. So I'm, I see this film and two things happened. I made one, two decisions. One, I wanted to be around whatever that was up there. It caught me. And it caught me in a way that, that I stuck with it. Secondly, I wanted to be on God's side because I saw what Charlton Heston had done to Ewell Brenner. <laughs> and so the next day, much to the surprise of my uh, parents, who were not aware that I was having a spiritual awakening in the back of the 55 Ford um, uh, that night, I went down the aisle at Linda Baptist Church and got dipped and dunked, and I surrendered all to God. And I had a very emotional experience. I remember thinking, now everything's going to be okay. I'm not going to be that lonely kid. I'm not going to be a part. I walked down there. I was going to feel connected. But I was like the newcomer who comes to Alcoholics Anonymous and just comes to the meetings. And you'll hear somebody say, uh, 90 meetings in 90 days. Good idea. Uh, don't drink and go to meetings and everything will be okay. That's a lie. If you don't drink and go to meetings and you don't work the steps and don't do anything to change and don't, don't surrender, you will be miserable. You'll be much better off drinking. And uh, so, so I, 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 I was like that guy who comes in brand new, who walks into, and I didn't do anything to change. And I didn't have a sponsor. The great part is, you saw these sponsors giving out chips. The sponsor's the guy who's been walking a little bit longer than you, so he can tell you what's going on. He can tell you why you feel the way you feel. And so I didn't have anybody to tell me, and so after a few days or weeks or months, whatever period it was, and I felt no different than I had, and I was still that scared little Baptist Boy Scout, I decided that God loved you, but he didn't love me. I never thought God didn't exist. I just thought God didn't care for me. And I would hear the chosen ones. So somebody was being chosen. And I wasn't it because my life didn't change. I didn't realize I had to do something to activate that change, to accept that gift. You know, we're in a season right now of gifts. And tomorrow and the next day, we celebrate a do-over, a brand new start. And there's no program that gives more in gifts and gives more do-overs than Alcoholics Anonymous. We're the most gifted people on the face of the earth. And without any merit, just because God loves us. But it took me a long time to figure that out. So at this point, I think, now God doesn't want me. I don't fit in with humans. You know, so, so I just lived in my daydreams, just pretending to be whatever I was going to be. And, you know, I did, I, I, I was in, you know, there's a movie, American Graffiti, where uh, 
uh, where one of the guys who's kind of ends up being a pharaoh, and, uh, and he's not a pharaoh at all, if you've seen this movie. Sorry, for those of you who don't obsess about movies, I may have a scene in here, too, that you don't, don't know, but if you don't, you can, you can Google it and find out. So, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm this guy who just doesn't fit in no matter where I go. I'm always play acting. My next spiritual experience was when I was 14 years old. I was playing Babe Ruth League baseball. I was the center fielder, the left fielder, and I were camping out the night before a game. His older brother got us a six pack of beer and a half pint of gin. I drank the beer and he drank the gin. And I had, for the first time in my life, I didn't see a lot of alcohol around my house, so I didn't have any expectations or anything else. I did not get sick. I felt absolutely just like I thought Moses must have felt when he had that staff in the top. <laughs> And I just felt like I, everything that was on my back fell off. It weighed nothing. And from the very beginning, I was not a stay-at-home drunk. I was a go-to-town drunk and going to town when you're 14 minutes hitchhiking. We had hiked up to a place called the White Castle. And uh, do they have White Castles down here? Okay, it's a place you go when you're drunk at 3 o'clock in the morning to eat a dozen of cheeseburgers. <laughs> they have about 200 onions on each one of them that seem like they're a good idea when you're drunk at 3 o'clock in the morning. Anyway, so... We hitchhiked up to the White Castle, and I am absolutely, I was very ill at ease around my own age group, much less adults, but I'm table hopping. That was the night that I discovered table hopping. I'm topping from table to table. And back then, the, the kids and adults were very disparate in, in the way we dressed and everything else. The, the adults had hats and pipes, and everybody wore a coat and tie. To, it seemed like everything, and the kids were in kids' clothes. So we were running around, and I was table hopping and introducing myself to me. I, there was a beautiful redhead behind the counter. I was getting along with her fine. But my buddy Dave was not having the same spiritual experience I was. Dave was getting a little woozy. Now, I never had a cup of coffee either, but I had seen in Perry Mason where if you have too much to drink, you have a cup of coffee, and it sobers you up so you can talk to the police. <laughs> it's going to come in handy in a minute. So, um, so I got some, some coffee from my, my buddy Dave, and it did not have the desired effect for Dave. Um, Dave threw up the st down the stainless steel counter. And uh, so as it turns out, if you're looking for a Louisville City policeman at midnight, the best place to find them is at the White Castle. <laughs> so um, two of them came down and said, what's the matter with your friend? I would have been scared to death to talk to somebody of authority, a policeman, before then. But I was just stood up straight and tall and I said, well, he just had a little bit too much to drink. Really? How old is he? <laughs> How old is he? 14. How old are you? 14. So I was in Louisville City Jail four hours after I took my first drink. <laughs> and that was pretty much the end of my social drinking. <laughs> I would have told you um, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous that my real drinking problem started my last two or three years when I was sleeping on the floors or out in the streets or whatever. Um, but here's what happened the first three times I took a drink. The first time I take a drink, I get arrested. Nobody in my family, to my knowledge, I'm doing a genealogy. I can't find anybody else in my family that has ever been arrested. All kinds of medals and honors, but nobody else has been arrested. I get arrested, and I can't wait for that experience again. The second time, I, uh, an older buddy uh, guy on the football team got me something to drink that was a little bit stronger. It was something I would highly recommend to you if you're going out on a slip called cherry vodka. And um, I didn't enjoy the taste, but it got me there faster. And the third time I took a drink, this was all in a few weeks period, was Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, and that's what I drank until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't enjoy the taste of any of the three of those first drinks, but they successively got me there that much quicker. I was concerned about getting it in me and getting that feeling where I felt whole. And for the first time, it made me feel like I fit in and like I could talk to other people. At the same time period, I had, was dis, disaffected from all human beings, from my family, from people at church, from people at school. I played baseball with some guys. I was friends with a few guys there. But um, the one person I was absolutely in love with and obsessed on was uh, my girlfriend. Um, we were 14. I was the quarterback on the JV football team. She was the captain of JV cheerleaders. We talked on the phone three hours every night. We went on hay rides. We went to movies. We held hands. Um, and absolutely uh, in love with her. I would have, if you'd have been a 450-pound lineman, I would have fought you to the death for her. 
And after she found out about me getting locked up, she came and said, I haven't told you this before because uh, it, I, I'm embarrassed about it, but my dad has a drinking problem. When he drinks, he gets angry and he gets mean and it's not pretty. And I need to ask you not to drink uh, uh, if we're going out. And it took me less than a day to decide to break up <laughs> with the only person that meant anything to me at all. So somebody could have told me I was an alcoholic back then, but it wouldn't have made any difference. In fact, we had a family doctor who did tell me I was an alcoholic when I was 17. But it didn't make any difference. By the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had been arrested 22 times. None of the times that I was arrested was I arrested for anything of intelligence or any kind of um, <laughs> crime where you made money. Uh, only one of them was a DUI. So 21 of them were for the outstanding characteristic of any newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> defiance. <laughs> I was defiant. You were not going to tell me what to do. And... Uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was the guy, if you were pulled over by the side of the road, my buddies loved me because you'd be pulled over the side of the road and stopped by a state trooper. I would pull in behind you, walk up to the state trooper and said, officer, what seems to be the problem here? <laughs> so they would go home and I'd be the one in handcuffs and taken off at the end of the conversation. Um, I got arrested at my senior prom. Now in Louisville, Kentucky at senior prom time, we have something called the Kentucky Derby. And uh, for prom weekend and derby weekend are usually the same weekend. And so um, uh, by this time, after my first few experiences drinking with my family and in the family I was living in, my dad said, you know, if you're going to live that way, you can't live in this house. So I went out and got an apartment with some older boys. And I would go back now and then to emotionally blackmail my mom uh, to get something from her. And uh, that's just the way I lived. And they didn't really know where I was most of the time, and they didn't know where I was prom night, except they assumed that I was at the prom. Well, they found out the next morning because on CBS, ABC, and NBC News, they had national news when I was, this time, I was over 18, so I wasn't thrown in the juvie tank, I was thrown in the uh, felon tank, two counts of assault and battery on a police officer at my senior prom, and I was thrown in the felon tank with eight bays. Now, I thought I knew all about race relations because I'd gone to a school that had two black kids, and I got along with both of them. <laughs> But I found out, I learned more that night because the next morning on ABC, NBC, at CBS News, which was all there was back then, um, they brought out seven Black Panthers who had been locked up for bringing a bunch of explosives into Louisville to blow up Churchill Downs, and me in my little powder blue tuxedo jacket. You know, Barbara and I have been married uh, uh, 28 years, and um, she goes back with me for Christmas and stuff, and I still, after almost 35 years in the program, get treated, you know, kind of like the black sheep. But I'm just giving you a glimpse into what they had to deal with, and it takes, it may take two or three hundred years before they really get over all this stuff. <laughs> but they do let me come up there now. So, um, no, I, I, I was, I... I did not uh, uh, stop seeing movies. I, I think the year after I graduated, I saw The Graduate 10 times. And um, I had made it all the way through school without smoking. I started smoking after I saw The Graduate and had an affair with an older woman. <laughs> She'd be about 89 now. And, uh, so, but books, you know, and I was still reading a lot. Anything that had to do with my mind going someplace other than where I was in me, uh, worked and I was reading a lot of Hemingway. We sat, we drank, we enlisted, and um, so I sat. I sat with several uh, um, recruiters. The Marine recruiter was the one who drank the best. I decided to enlist. I go in. I went to Vietnam. I actually did well in combat. I did well. My third. Uh, I had two years in, in two tours in Vietnam. Then I came back, and my last tour was in the Pentagon. I did not do well in the Pentagon. <laughs> But I did well in combat and uh, made good rank. Um, but always, again, some kind of fantasy. I always had booze on me someplace, even in the middle of the jungle. I had some, some way where I was not going to go without a drink. Um, so I came back from there. I had uh, fallen in love with a girl. Um, I knew that uh, I wasn't going to make a career out of the military like the rest of my family. For one thing, my idea of a breakfast meeting is about 10 -ish. <laughs> and um, these guys got up really early, and, and so it was difficult to drink the way that I did, so that wasn't going to work. So I, I came back to Louisville, and, and uh, 
uh, fell in love with a, a girl that looked like um, Olivia Newton-John. Everybody, I was engaged six times before I got to AA. <laughs> Nobody ever married me, but <clears throat> every one of them looked like somebody I knew from the movies. And this is how I see it, I fantasize it, and then, you know, it becomes and whatever. So, um, um, uh, at, with about the same depth that Chevy Chase had in uh, uh, the golf, uh, the Caddyshack. See the ball, see the ball. So that's the way I was, and I would. Uh, so this girl looked like Olivia Newton-John. If you're young, Google her. She was a hottie, and um, I got. Uh, I I was absolutely in love with her. She and I. I came back to Louisville. I was working at an ad agency. I was writing and producing commercials. I was on the way to doing what I wanted to do. This was the biggest ad agency in the region. I was doing very well at that. I didn't have to work very many hours. They just made sure that I made the deadlines. I was doing okay. Um, she and I were talking about getting married. We just needed to figure out what to do with her husband. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know how we are. Alcoholics do not give up. We've got willpower. And I, and I just kept in there, kept in there, kept in there, kept in there until I got her separated and taken apart from this evil guy that she was married to who was an advanced man. Of, he was an attorney working for the Nixon administration. Nixon was running for re-election. And so, uh, and he was out on the road most of the time, and <coughs> I had been an expert marksman uh, on active duty, and so we had a few run-ins, and I went after him with a shotgun, he was an attorney, he came after me with a warrant, and so, <laughs> but I didn't give up, and um, so we finally got things settled, and, and uh, he, got, uh, he got out of the, the picture, and we were getting ready to get married. And, and um, I was, I, I just, I lived in a, a, we were engaged, and it was about two or three weeks from the marriage, but I was a daily drinker in high school. We drank country club malt liquor before I went to high school, and then when I started drinking lunchtime, and then I started drinking afterwards, I was tending bar by the time I was a junior, and the other kids from school would come in there, and I'd have to cart them. What are you doing? So I, I've been drinking actively so long at that point and so forth. But I was a daily drinker who also would go on binges on top of that. And I can't tell you why or how, but now and then, daily drinking, I didn't have blackouts. But when I go on a binge on top of the daily drinking, which was around the clock drinking, so I'm not sure what the difference was, but I just, more intensity, try harder. And so uh, on the binges, I'd lose a day or two, and I, apparently I lost two or three, about three weeks before we were supposed to get married. So uh, this girl came to me and said, uh, um, you know, I think we need to reconsider this. And we need to, to take some time and think about that. And any time that something didn't work out the way I wanted it to, I was ready for you to reject me. God rejected me. I didn't fit in with my family. Why wouldn't you reject me? And I was ready. I usually had something else lined up. I had another job lined up. Sometimes I had another girlfriend lined up. But this particular case, I actually was really in love with this girl, and I wanted things to work out. And I was hurt. And I blamed her. And when I blamed somebody else, I needed to comfort myself. Because my entire world was around pleasing me, taking care of me. And so I didn't know how to comfort myself. I was already drinking as much as I could. And I went to high school. And, and I, uh, when I went to high school, I never saw, I know most of you know that Kentucky is kind of on the cutting edge of hip. But I never actually, I never actually saw any drugs when I went to college. I mean, we had Rebel Yell, which was bourbon with a rebel flag on it, and that was the closest thing to a drug I knew about. And uh, I had seen in Vietnam, I'd seen some drugs, and uh, but I that I developed a kind of an attitude where I looked down on people who did drugs. And uh, I'm not saying I didn't smoke a few joints or accidentally do LSD on a plane ride one time, but uh, but I thought if you did drugs, you lack self-discipline. And, um, you know, uh, and, and John Wayne drank, you know, two-fisted drinkers, that's what I was thinking I was. And so, um, uh, so I didn't have, so I wasn't going to go use more drugs, I couldn't drink any more than I was, so I had to find some escape. In Vietnam, they gave us certain beers to try, brand new, and also certain magazines, one of them was called Penthouse. And uh, I had never seen Penthouse before I went to Vietnam. Penthouse had this section that... Uh, I'm an intelligent man, and it had a section that appealed to me and several of the guys I was there with um, called the forum, or the letters section, which were intellectual and philosophical ideas of how we might live our life. And, um, um, and so uh, there was a particular concept in there called Menasha Trois, and um, I didn't speak French at the time I was in uh, Vietnam, which is, later on I found that was French Indochina before it was Vietnam. But, 
we weren't focused on details. And so, uh, uh, so but this kind of idea of the menage, just, it rung a bell with me. You know how some things stick with you? And so, uh, uh, I had actually brought this up several times with my fiance, uh, uh, usually at intimate moments, but her having formerly been married to Nixon age, she was a little conservative, so she wasn't going for that. So now, she cast me out, I'm hurt, I'm trying to find some reparation for this terrible heart pain that I have, and I go, and, and uh, I'm, uh, so now, I want to bring this up because this is the kind of trouble you can get into without a sponsor. <laughs> if I'm going to have this menage, I would like for the two girls to like each other. So, there was another concept in there which I now know I didn't completely understand, but it was called lesbian. So I'm now looking for a lesbian bar in Louisville, Kentucky, 40 some odd years ago, so I can find two women that are waiting to be with me. And if you don't know what's wrong with that, keep coming back. <laughs> and I lived in this apartment where there were 11 of us. We all knew each other. It was all Marine Corps, Army, Navy, everybody veteran. And, and, and some of them were married. Those of us who had stayovers would bring the, the girl out on Sunday morning. We always got up. Whoever got up first popped the keg. We had a pool there. We played volleyball. And we were men and, and our wives and our girlfriends and all this stuff. But these guys are all pretty straight. I know they're not going to know where I can find a lesbian bar to go to. And, um, and so, uh, but you know, we don't give up. I kept digging around, digging around. I was working this ad agency and one of the art directors in the back who, you know, uh, nobody was out about anything back then. So one of the art directors uh, who probably had, had some friends that were there uh, uh, came up and said, well, you might try this place. So I go down to find this lesbian bar where I'm going to find uh, these two women that are going to have an, an affair with me, and um, and I'm going to feel better about things, and then we'll then we'll take a look at life, and so um, and that's the way I dealt with things. That and on a cocktail napkin, I would write down you know plans on that, and so I, I go and and I walk into this bar, and and I've been given great uh, recommendations, and there's a guy playing the piano, and there's a woman at the bar, and that's it. And I said, man, this is not what the happening place this guy told me, and um, this was. Uh, in Louisville, and Louisville's kind of a conservative town, so I didn't expect a lot, but I expected more than that. I'm getting along with the guy playing the piano, I'm getting along with the woman that, uh, she's a veteran, but I can tell there's not gonna be any menaging. And um, <laughs> about this time, there was a staircase on the other side of the room. It was a big room with a dance floor, and it opened up, and suddenly, almost as in slow motion, there was a show called The Loretta Young Show, in which this beautiful woman comes down the staircase with a long gown. I don't know what color her hair was, because. TV was black and white. But in this case, this beautiful woman with red hair, this flowing gown comes just, it was almost like in slow motion, we're just moving towards each other. We got to the middle of the dance floor, we're holding on to each other, we're kissing, we cannot get enough of each other. And you know how when you're in love, you'll take three steps to the other way and you start kissing again, you just don't want it to go away. And I'm absolutely in love, and, I, I, and then I remembered my mission. I said, by the way, do you have a girlfriend that we can add uh, tonight? And, uh, and, and she said, oh, are you into that? I said, oh, yeah. And she said, well, why don't we get to know each other tonight, and tomorrow we'll add somebody. And I'm saying, thank God I did not marry that Republican woman. And so, <coughs> so we holding hands and kissing. And we get back to my place, and this is Saturday night, and this is one good-looking redhead, and I'm thinking, she is going to be hot out there tomorrow when we go up to the volleyball thing. And drugs, rears its ugly heads again. Um, Erica was her name, and she pulled out a pill that was big enough to choke a horse, and it was actually a horse tranquilizer called a Quaalude, which was popular back then. I said, would you care for one? I said, no, thanks, I don't do drugs. And I took another shot or two of wild turkey, and two things happened. Erica passed out, and I found some equipment that I definitely wasn't looking for. <laughs> And after three or four days, I said, this is not right. <laughs> this is the point at which my moral compass stopped working because I had never seen Opie or Wally ever deal with this in any episode. <laughs> so it was time for me to leave town, and I did. I, I was getting fired from the job that I got fired from, not because I didn't do good work. I'd won a lot of awards for the ads and the commercials that I produced for this agency. But the guy said, are you aware that you missed 94 days this year? I said, 
No? So that seems like a lot though, doesn't it? Yes, that's, so we no longer need your services. So I'm getting fired, but before I got fired, I had already gotten a job, taking my awards that I got, and with the biggest ad agency in the world, in New York. So within a month, I was in New York, staying at the Barclay Hotel and the Plaza Hotel, and writing and producing commercials for Coca-Cola and flying around on Lear jets, and I had an assistant that was with me, so we'd go out and produce commercials, and I'm staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel out, and, and the worst thing that can happen to an alcoholic is everything's okay. You get everything you ask for. And within a short time period, um, I couldn't control my kidneys or my bowels, and I would have little accidents different places. And it wasn't too long, and I did a bunch of things. I got some awards. Uh, one of the commercials I did, they bring out at Super Bowl each time with a football player and a kid, and, and uh, uh, you know, I worked really well for two or three hours a day. And some days I had to take off. And they didn't care so long as I did the work. They honestly did. That's just the way it was back then. And one day I was uh, producing some music, and this was before computers, and so we have a lot of musicians, strings and orchestra and singers in there, and it was, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, and they're all singing the song. And it was 10 o'clock in the morning and I couldn't talk because I had had a couple of drinks when I got up that morning, but not enough to stop it. And I was slurring, and I couldn't, I couldn't speak. And I left the studio with all those people in the studio and went around the corner to a bar, and there was a, uh, one of those hole-in-the-wall bars where you look at the mirror. It couldn't be more than 20 feet wide. And I was the only one in there. And this guy poured me a triple, and I'd never been in there before, and I thought, I wonder how he knows I'm a big drinker. <laughs> because I thought of myself as a big drinker. And I took that and spilled it all over the bar. Then he poured me another triple, and I, I had seen another movie called Lost Weekend with Ray Milan, where he takes a towel and uses the lever to bring it up to his mouth, and I did that. And then I got another one down. And I evened out a little bit, and I got ready to walk back, but I looked in the mirror first and saw somebody, and I didn't even recognize who I was. And I wondered what had happened to that kid who had at one time been a candidate to go to Brown or Harvard or Yale or wherever he wanted to go and whose parents wanted so much for him. And I was 25 years old. And I got moved from then. They didn't fire me. They, they, they tried to give me some help. They offered me help. And they sent me to Atlanta, which is where you are banished to if you're a bad boy up in New York. And uh, so I was doing Coca-Cola bottler stuff and that didn't last very long before I got fired, but I was in a basement apartment there. And I had had no contact. I was estranged from my family by that time. Uh, people who cared about me, even the people who drank with me, uh, didn't spend any time with me. And I would come to pass out, come to pass out. I would come to and I'd be shaken. I'd get a drink down and I'd dry heave a little bit. In my last two or three years, I didn't drink any food at all. And I was malnourished and dehydrated. And I had that puffy face here. And I was starting to have hear voices coming out of the heating ducts. And I thought there was somebody after me. And I had one outfit of clothing. I had a blue polo shirt, some yellow pants, um, a pair of Weegeons with uh, loafers with a hole in the bottom of them. And I carried a 45 every place I went because I was paranoid. I thought somebody was after me. And that was it. That's all I had, plus a little black and white TV. And everything else was went to buy booze. And I went up to the liquor store on a street corner and, and that was close to us, the only one near me. And I'd gotten evicted from my apartment. I went in there, and, and uh, as bad as that was, I thought, as long as I have whiskey, I'm okay. And I walked in there, and the guy that owned the liquor store came out, and he said, we know that the checks you've been writing for so many months are no good, and we need to ask you not to come into our liquor store anymore. And as humiliating as that was, because this was not a high-end liquor store, the only thought I had was, oh, God, I hope he gives me that whiskey. As long as I had the whiskey, I was okay. And he did give me the whiskey. And I came out of there and I was walking around and there was a concrete landing. And it was almost like slow motion again where that whiskey bottle just fell out of my hands, hit that concrete landing, and broke. And I was more afraid and more hopeless at that moment than I'd ever been in a firefight in Vietnam because I didn't have anything to fight back with. I wasn't trained to do anything with this. I couldn't live without a drink. And I couldn't get a drink. And I was so angry at this God who had turned his back on me, who I had blamed for almost everything that happened in my life that didn't go well. Because I tried to give myself to him, and he didn't want me. And I got angrier and angrier and angrier. 
and I started screaming at the top of my lungs. And I pulled out the gun, and I had a bolt in the chamber, and the safety officer was getting ready to put a, uh, uh, a 45 in my head. And I just started screaming at God at the top of my lungs. I said, God, blanket, God, blanket, God, blanket, cursing God, and something broke, and I started saying, God, help me, God, help me, God, help me. And a moment of peace came over me in the scene of another movie that I had seen 50 times drunk that was written by one of us who got sober called Days of Wine and Roses. It was bigger than life, and I saw Jack Klugman turn to Jack Lemon and say, I understand you need help. I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous. And I walked up to a phone booth. I didn't have had a phone in many years and didn't know anybody around there had a phone. I walked up to a phone booth on a street corner and I called on a hot summer day in Atlanta. And I didn't have a nickel or a dime. I called the operator and I was crying. I said, I'm an alcoholic. I need help. And because somebody had done some work and taken a message to the people that worked for that phone company and they knew about Alcoholics Anonymous, the woman who answered that phone said, hold on just a minute. She didn't hang up on me. And she connected me with a woman who had just started a year earlier running the central office for Atlanta. It was Helen Rowe. She's still running the central office for Atlanta. And she's got 44 years now. And we see her a lot. And she said, honey, you just wait where you are. I'm sending somebody out to talk to you. And she sent out a guy who had a year and a half sobriety who had been working for the railroad, who was making his way back, who lived in a one-room apartment with a hot plate. And he showed up, and he had a bad toupee and a pipe, and I remember striped shirt and some plaid pants. <laughs> and I'm thinking, bad on some, bullet. Bad on some, bullet. Because I was judging this guy. But he started talking, and he had read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he did what we do when we call on somebody. He had that gift of one alcoholic to another. And when he shared, he didn't share about me. He didn't tell me about me. He tell me, told me about himself. And he relived the horrors of his past. And I didn't see the bad toupee or the pipe or anything else. I saw his eyes. I saw his spirit. What I saw was there was something in him that told me that he was telling me the truth and that I should go wherever he was going, that this was my last chance here on earth. And that's what we do when we call on somebody and 12 step somebody. And I turned, those did the most complete third step I've ever done with anybody, and turned myself over to this guy. And he took me to a place to, I was already shaken, he took me to a place he knew I was going into DTs. And it was a hot summer day, and even though he lived in a one room apartment with a hot plate, he had a brand new car. You know how we are. <laughs> it wasn't much of a car, it was a Pinto. But it still had the little uh, retail thing on the outside of it. And, um, uh, and so he said, we'd be okay. I'm going to stop in here at an ATM machine, which I hadn't heard of either. And, um, uh, and he said, I'm going to get $20 out of this machine. And I said, sure, I'll be okay. And while he was gone, I threw up down the inside of his, uh, I couldn't get the door open, threw up down the inside of his door. And the only thing he did was come and put his arm around me, say, it's going to be okay. And if he had jumped at me, if he had corrected me, if he'd been angry at me, I wouldn't be here. All I got, I hear people talk about the way it was in the old days. I don't know what it was like 60 years ago. But 35 years ago, all I got when I got here was unconditional love. I didn't get foolishness. They didn't let me get away with foolishness. But all I got was unconditional love from everybody that I met. And this guy took me to a place, and another guy who's dead now uh, stood with me, and. I went into DTs for about four or five days, and if you go into DTs, if somebody will come up and put their hand on your arm, it takes you out of the delusions. Human contact stops that, that uh, us being lost. And so this guy named Joe sat with me for four days and helped me get through the DTs. And they got me up and out of there. The big book says when we take that third step that we have whatever we need. And I had taken that third step. And somebody gave me a car just temporarily to drive back to Louisville, Kentucky, which is my hometown. I was down in Atlanta at that time. And they gave me the name of my new sponsor. In those days, we didn't pick the sponsor because we were very sick. So what did we know about who we were picking? <laughs> I still think it's a better idea to have the sponsors pick you. But anyway, uh, we, we didn't pick sponsors. They picked a sponsor for me. And his name was on the back. His name was Jack Sullivan. He was another railroad man. And he was sober for many, many years. He's been dead about 12 or 15 years now. But he had about 40 years when he died. 
And from that day until now, I've not been in any time of my life when I haven't had a group of men who are willing to do anything and everything to make sure that I stay sober. But they told me two things, and this is the, the, the big message for tonight. One year is a great time. It's a great time because you see now that you can live without alcohol. But it's just the beginning. We have a lot of people that are coming into our fellowship and going back out because they're trying to stay sober on the fellowship. They convinced me from the very beginning that I would get sober on the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, which was an absolute all or nothing, God is everything or nothing. I didn't have to understand God, but I had to surrender to whatever power there was in this program. And I did the very best I could to do that. And I surrendered. And I went through, every year we had an annual house cleaning. I still do an annual house cleaning with the guys that I sponsor. And I went through, during those early years, I, I, the one thing that kept me here for the first year and a half was I had a job in my group, and I see everybody here has responsibilities. And they didn't give me a job that required any thinking because I had brain damage. I couldn't carry on a conversation with you, so I got confused a lot. And nobody laughed at me about that either, by the way. They just kept me included. They brought me to everything. <laughs> But I, didn't, but I needed a job. So in those days, in Louisville, Kentucky, if you came into Alcoholics Anonymous and you didn't smoke, it was mandatory that you learned how to smoke. <laughs> so they made me the ashtray guy for my home group. And I've only had one period where I didn't have a job in Alcoholics Anonymous in the last, uh, in the last three and a half decades. And that was between 12 and 15, I decided that I wasn't getting enough for me and then I wanted to get in touch with me and have some issues. And by the time I was 15 years sober, I was in a hotel room in Los Angeles trying to find a gun so I could put a bullet in my head. And I had to start over. I didn't drink, but I was about as dry as you can get without drinking. And, uh, and I didn't have a job or any responsibility. I had one guy who was still sponsoring who was so sick that he didn't know how sick I was. And that was it. You know? Um, but I got this job, and I was the ashtray guy, and we had 10 ashtrays, and they were gold, blue, red, and green, Christmas tree colors, and they were made out of corrugated metal, and uh, the GSO, our general service office, sold them for a while, and, and uh, they actually were designed so that the cigarette ashes would chemically fuse with the metal <laughs> down in there, and I had a Brillo pad, and I kept my uh, ashtrays spick and span in my home group. They were great. And uh, I, was, I was more proud of being the ashtray guy in my home group than I was of being the creative director at uh, this New York ad agency and winning a couple of quills because one was real and one wasn't. And so uh, I, I was there and people knew I was the ashtray guy and then one came they came up to me and I found out about this thing we call rotation. And that's a principle in Alcoholics Anonymous where none of us get to run everything uh, so that our egomania doesn't take over and so that we only get to serve in a position for a year, two years, whatever it is. And they came up and they said, we have a new guy who's going to be the ashtray guy. And I said, really? And I said, uh, yeah, his name is Raymond, and uh, he needs a job more than, and, I, and my first response was, I don't think so. <laughs> they said, and he needs a job more than you do. And, you know, that's what they pull on you in AA. He needs it more than you do. So they said, but we've got a job for you. You're going to be the chair person. And I said, I'm going to be the chair person? No, you're going to be the chair person. <laughs> and um, uh, so you're going to set up chairs. Well, here's the deal. There were 40 chairs and only 10 ashtrays. So this is a promotion. And um, so if you get a job in AA, you will never be without a job because you'll just get rotated into another job, another job, another job. Barbara and I have had, I've, we've both been delegates in our different programs and chairs and I've been on all you know, boards in New York and stuff like that. I've, it's a great opportunity because you get to see a different view of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's nothing greater than standing at the door and greeting the new guy that comes in and making sure. But, and that's, I still do that, but the other jobs are good too, and they're, they, they're wonderful. And as long as I've had them, there is this dynamic in Alcoholics Anonymous where if I'm sponsoring these guys, and these guys are watching me, and then I got a sponsor, it's very hard for me to misbehave a lot without everybody knowing about it. Yeah. So, today, if I got away from that for 90 days, I would start misbehaving. And then I would start feeling uncomfortable with myself. And then where am I gonna escape? And so that part of the fellowship is a spiritual aspect of the fellowship, and it works great. And so the guys I sponsor help me to stay. They help me as much as I help them, and, it, and, and we help each other that way. But I can't get to the point where I'm in this fourth dimension, where I have this spiritual experience, where I have a spiritual awakening until I work through these steps. And so finally, after the brain damage, I start going through the first few house cleanings. I had nothing on them. I had one girl that I resented. I don't even remember who she was, but I don't think I had one. Finally, I got down to it. I resented everybody. 
I resented God because he didn't accept me. I resented you because everybody had power over me. If I was to give you the meaning of life right now, you probably wouldn't be able to use it, but it's in the big book. It says, God has all power. There is one who has all power. That one is God. The relief of that is, if God has all power, I have no power. But it also means you have no power. So there's nobody in this room that can do anything that can ruin my life. So I don't have to spend a whole lot of time trying to resent anybody in this room. I don't have to spend a lot of time trying to get you to approve of me. I don't have to spend a lot of time doing anything except doing what God, my loving Father, wants me to do. Because every promise in the big book is a promise from God, the Father, who says that if I follow the dictates of a higher power, I will presently live in a new and wonderful world regardless of the present circumstances. That if I had a new employer to the extent that I kept close to him and performed his work well, he provided what I needed. Every promise in there is conditional upon me doing what God wants me to do. And I can't tell you how many people in my home group, people with one, two, three, four years, have come to me in the last couple of years and said, I need a job. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. We'll do a talent inventory, offer it up to God and see what he wants to do with you. Uh, uh, and they go on. They wanted me to help get them a job. They didn't want God to help them get a job because they were afraid God would mess with what they wanted. If you are afraid God's going to mess with what you want, you won't do well. That's the truth. But if you're willing to surrender to whatever God wants for you, there's unbelievable joy in this program. When I'm going through the amends and I go back to this Linden Baptist Church and I, where I walked down the aisle and I thought God had turned his back on me, I walked down there one, one Sunday afternoon out of fear of sponsor and I get up on Sunday afternoon and I say, this is who I am. In about five minutes, I told my, my short story, and I said, I'm here to apologize, and more than that, I'm here to make amends, so I would like to be a volunteer and to be useful in any way I can for the next couple of years. Two things happened. One, I found out my life got larger because I was safe outside of AA as well as inside because I found out God existed there and unconditional love existed there as well as uh, is in, in these rooms. The second thing that happened, I was trying to have a meaningful relationship at the time, and it wasn't going all the well because I was dating with girls in the program and first date, great, second date, third date, we're trying to find out how to go to different meetings. And so, um, <laughs> but there was a beautiful blonde in that room who was not at all what I was looking for. She was a seminary student and a good girl, and I was kind of looking for a new dancer who needed spiritual guidance. <laughs> I wanted to be helpful, but you know. And uh, so, uh, um, but that, uh, a uh, former seminary student uh, has been in the recovery business now for 25 years. She's got a couple degrees in counseling, and she's also my spiritual partner, and she's my wife, Barbara. <laughs> my experience is if you allow God to put you with someone through a ninth step rather than doing it on your own through the 13th step, it lasts. <laughs> God's never given me a gift where if I realized what he had given me and decided to take advantage of that gift and accept it and be grateful for it, it wasn't ten times what I thought it was in the first place. And that's been the case with Barbara. But it's a place with sobriety. At first when I came in here, I thought it was just me not drinking. And there's so much more to it. And so I go back, I, I make amends. I make The final amends I made was to this church that my dad, we're having a... As I mentioned, a surprise 90th birthday party for my dad. And when my mom died a few years ago, my dad got remarried there three years ago to a younger woman. She's 82. And, uh, um, and it's the church that he still goes to. And he drives the old people around. And uh, so I don't know who, who they are, the 120-year-olds. But anyway, uh, but he's very active. You wouldn't think that he's 90 if you saw him. A former test pilot and fighter pilot. And so... Um, I go to this church, and I had been so angry at this church, I'd defaced it, I'd done damage to it, and I didn't know how to make amends to it. And I couldn't find anybody in this church to even talk to. There was nobody in the church. And I went into the chapel, and I realized who I was there for. I had been asking God each morning to keep me sober, and thanking God for keeping me sober each night, while I still had a lot of anger and resentment and felt betrayed and didn't trust God. Now, if you're trying to surrender to somebody you don't trust, it's awfully difficult. And I had forgiven in this process human beings who didn't necessarily do something that merited my forgiveness, but I had to forgive them so I didn't hold a resentment against them. And I started forgiving God. 
And I had one of the most profound spiritual experiences I've ever had, where I felt like I weighed nothing, felt like there was a, uh, a breeze that just was blowing through my soul, and I just absolutely felt weightless. And I realized that for the very first time, not recovery, but for the very first time, I had a relationship with a living God and a loving God and the kind of God that we have in his rooms. Now here's the great news if God scares you off. AA was started after a prototype called the Oxford Group. And the reason they started the Oxford Group was because the church had gotten so everybody was telling everybody what this meant. But in the beginning, in the first century of the church, people just came in and said, I just met this man, and I was blind, but now I walk. And I was deaf, but now I hear. And I had a sword in my hand, but now I've laid it down. And I didn't know that guy until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and heard each person who came to this podium and listened to somebody who was in a mental hospital and put there for life and listened to somebody who had been out on the street who had almost lost his ear because of the infection of the, the insects that were in his ear sleeping on the ground. And now this guy was somebody who had been the ambassador to Ireland. Those are the kind of stories we have in Alcoholics Anonymous. Or a man who's going to speak in a couple of weeks or something or two who killed two people when he was 24 and because of what God did in his life became the warden of that prison system. Those are the kind of miracles that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe that that was what even the original church was meant to be and that if that happened every place like it does in Alcoholics Anonymous, you couldn't stop people from going to church. But that's not our issue. Our issue is here. We get to come here and in these meetings, rather than sharing this is what the big book means. There's a big movement out there for everybody to tell you what the big book means. And I do participate in Woodstocks where we share our own experience, but the only thing I've got is my own experience. But I can tell you specifically what God has done for me. And I've got maybe a handful of experiences where they're real and I felt like God was in a room, but most of them, like what I'm going to close with, are how could that happen if there wasn't a God? And that's what we share with each other. And that's all we've got to share. We don't have to be experts on God except that some power who loves us beyond our wildest dreams and provides us with something called joy where I know that that God loves me and I'm going to be okay regardless of any other thing going on in my life, chose me to give me this gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he chose Matt to give it to him. And Matt, you don't have any idea what's coming. But I can tell you this much. It kind of, if I could have found this before I ever took the first drink, I would have stuck with this, but there's no way for those of us in this room who have the kind of disease that I have to get it without coming through Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm, I, I make these amends. Right after that, I had the spiritual experience. I go to, I told you, the guys I ran with did an annual house cleaning. I go to an annual house cleaning with them. We happened to do it at a Trappist monastery called Gethsemane, which was near Louisville. And I had, I had done great, I'd been searching for God for a long time anyway. I did graduate work in intercultural studies. I read Thomas Merton, and Thomas Merton was a monk at Gethsemane. And, uh, and so I read all these, these people trying to find some intellectual approach to it. That didn't work, because you can't understand into what I'm talking about. What I'm sharing with you now is what happened to me, not what I understand. So I go into this thing, and I'm, I'm ready to find out what God's will is, and there's a priest there, and he comes out, and he does a special communion for us, where he doesn't give us the, uh, I'm not Catholic, but he didn't give us the, um, the wine, uh, even though he said it was uh, the actual blood, but I guess he didn't want to take uh, think I'm not sure why, but anyway, <laughs> just in case. Uh, he didn't give it to us, but we had the, the host, and, um, and this, this priest says, do you, you boys know what God's will is? And there were 12 of us, so we could figure out what it was, and some of them had been around for a long time, and he said, God's will is simple. It's to do the best you can right now, one day at a time, with what God gives you. You've been given many gifts, and you've been given many jobs on this planet. Use your gifts to do the jobs you've been given. It was confusing at first. He said, if you're a father, be a good father. If you're a husband, be a good husband. If you're a brother, be a good brother. If you, are a, if you have a job that you absolutely love and you do it well, do it honorably and love people through that thing until God gives you something else to do with those talents. If you have a job that you absolutely hate, do it honorably and love people through that job until God gives you something else. 
He said, God loves us, his children, the same as we love our children. And if you men had two seven-year-old boys, and you gave both of them little red wagons, and one of them took the red wagon around the neighborhood to spread joy to the other kids, and the other one took the red wagon and kicked it aside and said, I want a scooter, who would you give more to? And I had always been the kid who took whatever I was given, kicked it aside, and wanted something else. And it never even occurred to me that the point of having the gift in the first place was to use it to bring joy to others. It was to bring joy to me. And bringing joy to me doesn't work. But if you are doing things for other people, you become something called valuable. And all I ever wanted to be in my entire life was the person that people wanted to be near. They wanted to be around them because they were valuable. We have great value to other people because of the way we live and what we do. And in this room, it's not just, it's not just what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's the way we live throughout it that attracts people, but the gift we've got for another alcoholic is one that only we've got. So my life changed. Barbara and I have had a wonderful life in the last 28 years, and, and uh, uh, we've been involved in all kinds of service. We've been involved in everything you can be. We were at Killarney after speaking at the All Scottish Convention in 1987 and, and uh, walked up a row of four-leaf clovers to the top of a mountain where there was a beautiful uh, uh, stream coming down. We looked out at a lake that was just crystal blue and a sky that was perfectly light blue and, and green colors in a place called Muckross House near Killarney. And we were just sitting there crying. We were so grateful that God gave us this trip. But it's not always doing the best you can. It's not always that easy. In 2005, Barbara and I were unable to have children. We had a dog, um, a Norwegian elk hound that we called Booger Bear, and we had him for 18 years. And they usually lived to only be about 12. And we took him. He probably went to three or 400 AA conferences with us. And he was our child, and we had to put him to sleep. And we cried like we thought we'd never cry for anybody. And, and uh, just talked about the fact that uh, we probably wouldn't even grieve each other that way. Because... <laughs> dogs don't get mad at you. And so, um, um, but we're grieving this, and then within a few months, Barbara's mom and dad died within a week of each other. And my mom died a month later. So we lost three out of four parents, and this was 2005. I've been to seven internationals. I will be at the next one. I hope you will be. It's going to be in Atlanta. And uh, uh, we're in Toronto, and we come back from Toronto, and I go to take a physical, and I'm told that I have esophageal cancer. Esophageal cancer, all those years that I drank without eating any food and dry heaving, the damage we do sometimes we pay for later on. And uh, esophageal cancer is 99% fatal. Almost nobody lives. It's very rare, about 14,000 cases a year, and maybe a handful live. And of those who do live, they usually have problems. They have trouble uh, processing food. And uh, so I start, I can't. Now, she's just lost both her parents. Um, I can't, I, my best friend who was down here in Ocala, Florida, Keith Lewis, was my prayer partner. He's now, he's now gone, but he was, he knew and he was praying for me. My other prayer partner, Ed Mutum, knew and he was praying for me. My sponsor knew uh, and a couple other people and that's it. Because I couldn't tell Barbara that I had this fatal disease um, after she just lost her mom and dad and we put our dog to sleep. It's like country western song. And so, um, uh, so I wanted to find a solution. And because I couldn't tell her, I couldn't tell you because you don't gossip. And so, um, so I, I end up finding this place. There's one guy who's had great success. He's out at the University of Southern California, Clancy, and a guy named Lynn W. And these people are all trying to help me out there. They're, we got people all trying to pull strings to help me get out there. Uh, they said, yes, we can. It's a procedure where they take all of your upper digestive system out, all the esophagus, two-thirds of your stomach, take the, the stomach material, make a new replacement. You're on a feeding tube for a year, lots of operations, but you live. And so uh, that's what I found the solution. And, and finally, um, uh, I think I'm getting ready to go out there. I was getting ready to speak in Key West on a Saturday night. And uh, I got a call on Friday. I'm driving down there and, and find out that, uh, uh, that they wouldn't take my insurance. And once you've seen the sunlight of the spirit, if you go back and doubt again like you did before you came here, it's darker than it ever was. And now, 
I'm absolutely lost, and I'm trying to, to, to pray, and I can't even pray. And this friend of mine down there with me that I shared with said, say whatever prayer you remember from, that you've memorized. And I had memorized the 23rd Psalm to recite to the PTA in the third grade, and I used it in Vietnam. And I started reciting that over and over, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it's over and over, and something broke right before I went up to speak on Saturday night. And I remembered my first sponsor, Jack So talking to him when he came out of an office where he'd been told he had six malignant brain tumors and there was nothing they could do. And I realized what he was telling me and he was saying goodbye. And I said, Jack, you don't seem to have any kind of fear. He said, if God has been this good to me here, just to kind of imagine what he's got waiting for me on the other side. And the big book makes that promise. We will lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. We were reborn. I am a spiritual being having a human experience, and there's a time when this body's not going to be around. And I'm ready to go to paradise whenever that time comes. So if the worst you can do is threaten me with paradise, fear has no place in my life now. That brings me joy, because I know I have a loving Father that will take me someplace even better than this, but in the meantime, I get to be here with you on a night like tonight when we celebrate new life and new beginnings for everybody in this room. <laughs> and so I got up and I spoke and I went back and on Monday I got a phone call and they said, we still can't take you, but our chief of surgery has just gone to a place in Rochester, New York. We talked to him, we think he can help you. And I called up there. I can't even get my primary care provider to, to call me back, but the chief of surgery. <laughs> See, if God's in it, you don't need to work as hard to work out the details. Within an hour, the chief of surgery had looked at my film, looked at my labs. He said, I don't care about the insurance. I want to teach this procedure to other people. You need to. I'd like you to get up here in the next day or two. So now I've got to tell Barbara I actually have cancer. <laughs> I didn't lie to her, I said I was going to have to have some tissue removed. <laughs> I'm pretty creative. So, um, um, and she said she was kind of figuring it out, but she didn't want to know either. So now we get in the car, we head up to New York, and if your granddaddy served under Robert E. Lee at, at uh, Gettysburg, you don't really want to go to Rochester. Rochester's like almost in Canada, and, uh, to, to make your exit. And uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, and we didn't think we knew many people up there. We were gonna spo supposed to speak in uh, with Syracuse, uh, I think, the next year, but um, we didn't know a lot of people. But because of you and because of the way this family works, when we got to the hotel, we had people there. We had 23 of our brand new people who were in our AA and Al-Anon home groups. We went to a meeting that night. They took care of Barbara. They did her laundry. They got her out of the, the hospital room. We walked into the hospital the next day, and we go into the, to the chapel to to, uh, because we knew if this deal was going to work, God was going to be in the middle of it. And there on the wall, and 30 feet high, in letters that are a foot and a half deep in gold, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And we walked out to the lobby to see where God had taken us. And the name of the hospital is Strong Memorial Hospital, endowed by Dr. Leonard Strong, who was Bill Wilson's brother-in-law and helped start the Alcoholic Foundation in our program. My experience is that regardless of whatever small problem you think you have, God already has a solution. And instead of banging your head against the wall, if you'll surrender to God and people who are wiser than you, you'll find out where the power is in this program. And that's what I wish for everybody celebrating a birthday and everybody here tonight. Thank you.